In this film, I'm going to discuss my latest study, looking at how the first wave long haulers from March and April last year are getting on, now that they're clocking 18 months with the condition. And importantly, just how many have recovered? And if so, what's their secret? I've previously conducted recovery studies at both 6 and 12 months into people's long COVID journeys, to see just how many people are recovering and how the course of their symptoms is changing. I've actually been pretty shocked by the results of this study and the impact of long COVID on this cohort's health. Stick around and let's go through it. A few caveats to the data here, as usual. The sample is both self-selecting and self-reporting, and demographically likely to be a representation of Facebook and Twitter users where the survey was posted. The biggest flaw with this study is that it's hard to put it in front of those who have fully recovered. This group are less likely to frequent the long COVID support groups and may have disconnected themselves from long COVID Twitter. As a result, this group are likely to be underrepresented in the data. By how much, it's very hard to know. But this issue will have been shared by the two previous recovery studies I've done, so we can at least compare this study against those. One other encouraging sign is that the response rate for this study was the greatest so far. 1,600 people completed the one at six months, 1,100 people completed the one at a year, and for this study, the N is 2,250. Given that the study is exclusively for those who got ill in the first wave, that means we're capturing a greater slice of this group than we ever have done before. And only 36% of this cohort had completed the previous survey, so it's not like we're going to get the same people saying the same same things. Uh, unless, of course, it's the condition trying to tell us something. Right, so who were they? A big mix of ages, as we've seen before, with a bulge in the 35 to 44 and 45 to 54 age groups. 83% female and 16% male. Mostly from the UK, with large numbers from the US, mainland Europe and Scandinavia. The vast majority first becoming unwell in March 2020, with 12% preceding that and 19% in April. OK, so how do they feel it's been going? Generally, most people think they've been doing better than they were six months ago. And we saw this on the previous surveys as well, where people tended to feel that they had been seeing some kind of improvement. Less than a quarter here thinking they've been doing worse, and the big green and purple sections either doing slightly or much better. Look at this though, only 44 people, or 2%, claiming to be fully recovered. We can look at this another way later on. Which are the most improved symptoms? In order, breathlessness, fatigue, tachycardia palpitations, heart issues, neurological, and in fifth place, headache. This is exactly the same top five in the same order as it was at 12 months. And which symptoms have got worse? Here's the top five of pain. Number one, neurological. Then at number two, no symptoms have got worse. Number three, fatigue. Then tachycardia palpitations, heart issues. And finally, headache. Amazingly, exactly the same top five in the same order as they were at 12 months. And this is particularly remarkable when you consider that the majority of the people filling this in didn't even fill in the same survey last time round. This might just be the condition trying to tell us something. So which have been the most challenging aspects of long COVID? In the lead by a long way, fatigue, then neurological, then breathlessness, respiratory, fourth place tachycardia, heart issues, number five, mental health, and number six, impact on family and relationships. This is exactly the same top five as we had at 12 months, but the impact on family and relationships has climbed from P9 to P6. Unsurprising, really, that as time goes on, the toll becomes greater on those around us. Let's take a look at this particularly important question, as it gives us a more objective indicator for people's level of functional health. How many have been able to go back to work? Almost a quarter are not able to work at all. Almost 5% have lost their job as a direct result of long COVID. 22.2% can work at a much reduced level. Almost 9% are in the process of a staggered return to work. 19% can work full time but feel it is compromising their recovery. And here's the big one. How many can work full time without it affecting their health? The answer is just 8.3%. 
How many was it at the one year mark? Well, the answer is 7.8%. So this is a really minor incremental change. The right direction, of course, which is good. But fundamentally, this cohort looks very similar at 18 months to how they did at a year. And just how big is the impact of long COVID on people's health when you compare how they were before the virus to now, 18 months after the initial infection? These are the results that shocked me the most. Bear in mind that this includes all of the people who've now made a full recovery too, uh, those who we could pick up in the survey anyway. So pre-COVID, the vast majority of our respondents rated their health as an 8, a 9 or a 10 where 10 represented perfect health and one the poorest health they could imagine. And now? Just look at this, the modal average at 3 or 4 out of 10. This is really, really dramatic. And I wanted to take a look at this data by doing a paired t-test. Uh, and for this I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Craig van Nostrand for doing the data crunching. The t-test in this scenario is comparing people's health before and after COVID. How significant is the impact on a sufferer's health? Well, the primary numbers here are the T-ratio and the P-value. Uh, first off, the T-ratio of 87 is ludicrously high. And if the results are going to be statistically significant, we're looking for a P-value of less than 0.05. And, well, our P-value is so small that you can't even fit it in the box. So what does this tell us? Well, nothing we didn't really know in our bones already, but the negative impact of long COVID on our state of health is statistically off the charts, slam dunk disastrous. Now to make us feel a bit better, let's look at those who have recovered. The months between 12 and 18 do appear to be better than those from 0 to 6 and 6 to 12, which bodes well for those who got ill in the second and third waves. However, given that we had 217 responses to this question and only 44 people previously saying they'd fully recovered, I think some people are treating this question as when they turned a corner perhaps, uh, rather than now being fully recovered. And so now let's get into the subjective part of it. Did those who have recovered feel they made a change that catalyzed it? Amazingly, we've now got 350 responses. So filling in this survey obviously had a positive impact on people's perceptions of their health between the point when they answered question two and question 10. I suspect again, we're seeing people wanting to share things that they think have helped. Especially because by the next question, we've got 460 people recovered, 20% of the total. So not quite sure what to make of this, but anyway, what did these recovered or temporarily recovered people think had made the biggest difference? Number one, time. Two, pacing. Three, supplements. Four, diet management. Five, interestingly this one, uh, increasing exercise whilst remaining inside their energy budget. And then we have medication and alternative therapies. I do have data here on which supplements and what diet management strategies were mentioned, but I'm not sure it would necessarily hold up to scrutiny. So I'm going to have a spin through it and see if there's anything in there of interest. If there is, I will, of course, update the channel. I also asked recovered people what their one piece of advice would be. I'm not going to read all of these out, but I'll spin through a few and you can pause if you like. There are definitely some themes that come through. So I'll give it 30 seconds and uh, spin through for 30 seconds, so just skip ahead if you don't want to uh, <laughs> sit through it. So what are we to make of this? There are most definitely people getting better, but we don't seem to be looking at the same recovery profile of other kinds of post-viral fatigue, like that from EBV, that's uh, mono or glandular fever, depending on where you're based, uh, for example. So other forms of PVFS seem to largely resolve by 12 months, and that's not the case here. Well, what can we learn from that? Well, I think fundamentally the mechanism behind long COVID is different. And what that is, we still don't know. And the longer we continue with this slow rate of recovery, the more critical research becomes into finding out exactly what's driving the condition.
This point isn't very happy news, but there was an article I saw recently that caught up with the survivors of SARS-1 10 years later. Many of them were still suffering with symptoms that sounded, unfortunately, exactly like long COVID. Now, what I really wanted to see in that article was numbers. Was it just a few who had these long COVID symptoms 10 years later? Or was it the majority? Because the implications of the latter are frankly terrifying. There is hope though, so don't lose heart. More pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are coming into play week by week, and we're starting to see a bit of a picture of some of the complexities involved. Along with autoimmunity, one of the latest subjects of interest is the way the SARS-2 spike protein interferes with fibrinogen function, leading to microclots and poor oxygen perfusion, uh, metabolic dysfunction, and many other issues. I'll be covering that in detail in one of my next films, as well as discussing the reactions to the vaccines now that we've had much more time for more long haulers to get vaccinated. And spoiler, the results have changed quite a bit from the early results I reported in my study several months ago. So look after yourselves, until next time.